up till 7.30. Hmm? So we got another minute and a half. I hit the go live button, but it's not going to put us on until 7.30. Wait, actually, we're doing it live. Hmm. It didn't work? I think you got too quick. I think you got too quick. Okay. okay. This is something different for me. And uh, I thought well, you all agree that uh, times have changed. Well, I'm Wes Ganaway, president of the Whatcom County Historical Society. And I want to welcome you to our first program of the 2021 season. Hope that everyone uh, that is watching is OK with this. Uh, there'll be a note for, on the next uh, bulletin or next newsletter next month. A little, there's a little easier way to do this, and so we'll go to that. I'll send it out to everybody. I'm talking to you from the green room in the uh, Light Catcher Museum. My thanks go to uh, Drew Watley, who's the uh, lead museum educator, and uh, he's the one that set all this up. This segment is also being taped for a later viewing on Bellingham TV. The museum will also have it on their website in uh, a few days. I want to thank the board members for their continued participation during this time. We've only had one meeting this year and we did our social distancing and uh, came up with a few things. Not much going on so we didn't need any more meetings and we couldn't do them on the internet. I want to thank specifically Carol Tashima for her contributions for the last three decades or so working with the society. Uh, Carol has retired and of course she's moved to Seattle to be with her family. And uh, she's moving on to other projects and so uh, she's turned over the last of her chores with the society to the rest of the board. She's made a, 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 a position on the board for the whole, about the whole time she was uh, involved with the society, and she's been the lead, lead person on much of the activity. The theme for next month is going to be the rest, re-restoration of the uh, E Street brick building, the old C.E. Richards building, 1858. Uh, it's undergone several major changes in the last hundred years. <laughs> One of them uh, has been with the Historical Society. We owned the building from about 2004 until just uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, since then, it's been purchased by Brad Parberry, who owns all of the land around it. And uh, he's working, he's just about done with another re-restoration, uh, re I call it. Uh, the problem has always been the brick. The brick was very porous. Uh, it had some real water issues in the building. We had a flood a couple of years ago. And uh, so he's taking care of all of that. And on my program next month, I'll be talking about that, showing pictures and some work. Uh, it's describing, there's a lot of things we found out about the building when we took it back down to the studs that uh, are quite interesting. I've been involved with, uh, with the other historians in Whatcom County for a number of years. Uh, I started this in about mid-80. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be acquainted with a lot of them, including tonight's speaker. Micah Pirro has not only reached the history of the area, researched it, he's written five books about it in, in the events of Whatcom County. And he's currently, currently working on book number six. And so without further ado, I now turn the program over to Mike and Carol. Hello, good evening. My name is Mike Imperial. I'm so happy you're here tonight. I can recognize numerous people. I see my sister and my, my daughter. Hello, you guys. I'm trying to be smart. Not really. Uh, this is so weird doing this. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it was a world that Wes and I knew nothing about. And we, uh, about a week ago, got involved to put this program on. 
And in the beginning, we didn't know what Zoom was or, or any of the other stuff. Uh, at a point, I said, we're not, to myself, I said, we're not going to do it. I can't do it. And then finally, we agreed to do it. And, and we decided to do it because, as far as I know, children in kindergarten are doing it. And I would think that Wes and I could handle this. Okay, tonight my program is entitled Camp Glacier, F-12. Uh, and it is uh, uh, the story about the CCC camp in Glacier. It was created in 1933 and it, uh, it uh, was discontinued in 1941. The, the main focus on uh, the CCC camp was President Roosevelt. Uh, when he got elected in 1933, he had made some very strong statements that he was going to take the country out of the Great Depression. Depression. And uh, so he was determined to do that, but he was pretty secret about what he was going to do. He, he didn't publicize it until he got elected. He, he went to and had a lunch one day with his cabinet or a group of, uh, of, uh, of his advisors, and he then announced his program called the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps. And it was to, to prove and to, to do two things. One was to help improve the land in, in the United States. It was getting abused at that time. The, the Dust Bowl and uh, the timber was being stripped all over the country and, and, and uh, drainage was draining rivers and creeks and everything. So one of his functions was to do that. But his main function was to put young men to work. And uh, that was his main goal. And so at this luncheon, he told these people, this uh, that you're seeing is a napkin. And on that napkin, he outlined his program, and it, it had three major involvements. Number one was the Army, and the Army was going to, to build the camps, it was going to house the camps, uh, feed the camps, it was going to do everything for those people in the camp, but it wasn't going to handle the work they were going to do. The work that they were going to be performing was done by the Department of Labor. Then, there was one more part, I'm sorry, did I say labor? I'm sorry, it was uh, agriculture, the Forest Service, National Park, those people. Then the third leg of it was the issue of the recruits. And I just said recruits, and that is not the term that they wanted used. What they wanted used was enrollees. They didn't want it to sound like these, these young kids we're coming into a, uh, a military situation. And so right away he instigated this and it's unbelievable how quick this, in those days, 1933, how quick something could occur in our government. He, he uh, instigated a bill and it, it outlined what he wanted done. And it went uh, for a vote. Seven days later, it was back and it was approved. And now we've got the CCCs. Uh, and this chart that's on the screen right now shows the management of a camp. And it's very detailed. And all of this input came from the Army. The Army had been doing this kind of thing for 100 years and they knew how to do it, and they knew how to do it rapidly. The enrollees that were going to be in these camps were between 18 and 25. Now, another thing that the, the rules and uh, directions that each of these camps had kept changing. So if you read, you'll read at a, at a time that wasn't the age, but I'm going to use it tonight as 18 to 25. Okay, now what this is, is uh, of course the northwest corner of the state of Washington. And you can see in this the counties of, uh, of the upper, upper northwest. 
And you will see that the state, uh, the, the county of Whatcom, along with Skagit uh, and others, they were only allowed one camp per county. And they were allowed about 140 to 150 enrollees, okay? So a, a big county with a bigger population would get more. And in some of the counties, they had so many camps, you can't believe it like uh, Death Valley had like 18 different camps. Um, now, the, the camps were, were <clears throat> come from this, this zone right here. And, and the quartermaster, the, deep, the quartermaster depot was out of Fort Lewis. Now, the quartermaster is the home of all the supplies. And that could be food, it could be tents, it could be shoes, it could be anything it want, needed to be. The highest number that uh, the state got was 57 camps and it had 11,140 enrollees. Now we'll talk about Camp Glacier. Camp Glacier was located, let me start that over. Originally, Camp Glacier was located up at Shuxon, and it was across from the highway camp, and it was over there across the highway in the trees. And that's where it was originally uh, built, and it was started there. This is a picture of Fort Lewis at the uh, Quartermasters, and you can see all the buildings and everything there. I don't know if these were actually military people, men, or if they were paid civilians, I don't know. But if you look, they don't look very military. Now at this uh, camp, or at this depot, they had all kinds of products. You can see this is a World War I Army wool coat. And, and that was commonly issued to the CCC boys. In some cases, these were shipped to Death Valley for the CCCs. And you can see, it really didn't make a very good sense. I'm, I'm sorry I'm having trouble with this electronic thing. <laughs> and this is a typical hat, and you can see the CCC uh, logo on it. Now, when they started the camp and started the program, they recruited uh, the enrollees from all over the United States. And, and part of the program was is that they wanted to mix young men up and scatter them around instead of them staying in one area. And so that was part of the program. This is a bulletin from Chicago. And when uh, the glacier camp opened up at uh, Shuxon. Uh, it was it had about 120 uh, recruits from uh, Chicago, and they were so far from knowing what they were doing, it was utterly a, a fiasco. Here's a, and and the CCCs has a little handbook, and this was a handbook, and it's a very good little book. It told them about uh, no alcohol, no fighting, uh, no bullying. Uh, very well written. I happen to have a copy of it and it's, it's a good read. Okay, here, I'm going to get back to Camp Glacier in a minute. Here is two young men in the typical CCC Army uh, clothing. And, and it's fun to look at these pictures because they're not consistent. Now, if you look at the guy on the left, he's got uh, a pleat in his pants, but the guy on the right doesn't. And uh, that's the way it was. It was kind of a total mix of wardrobe. Here's another one. And what this is, is again a group of five young guys, and it's amazing to look how young these are. But now in the late afternoon, for dinner, they all had to dress in uh, their, their good outfit, uh, and they had to have ties on. They couldn't come to dinner in grubby clothes, grubby shoes. They had to come very dressed. This is a picture, now this picture is actually at Camp Glacier. 
And I just want to describe to you a little bit the buildings, and I'll get into that more. But the guy in the middle is a fellow by the name of John Penn, and he, uh, I, I located him. He lives in Everson, and he was a true gentleman, and he was 99 and a half years old when I located him. And he was so anxious to get my book that he constantly kept calling me, and he would say, Mike, you got to hurry up, I'm going to die. Well, he made it. He made it to the end of the book, and he really enjoyed it, and, uh, and then he died, right, at 100 years old. Okay, this is the first camp, and this camp was at Shuxon, and as I said, it was across the highway from the snow removal camp. In, in the first, uh, in the first uh, camp, there was uh, no wood buildings other than a restroom. The rest of it was all tents. And the original intent of the CCCs was that it was going to be all tents. Here is a picture of the, the head people. Now it's very common in a 200 man camp and, and then it was supplemented with uh, army uh, backup. And those people were, were uh, uh, in charge of construction, they were in charge of uh, medicine, doctoring, anything like that. And it was very common in those camps that with 200 uh, enrollees, there would be up to 40 uh, army employees at the camp. Now that seems like an awful ratio to me, but possibly they didn't have anything else to do with them. I, I really don't know. But, but here's a look at them. It's neat to look at the boots they're wearing. Uh, uh, just study each one. They're somewhat different. Now you probably can't see this, but what this is, is the enrollment paper of my dad. And my dad uh, was one year out of uh, high school and uh, he couldn't find a job. And so he applied for the CCCs. Now, if you were a young man and you applied for the CCCs, your parents had to be on relief welfare. I guess we call it welfare now, it was relief. But that had to be, and, it, and if your parents weren't, you were not eligible and you would not be a member. Uh, and it's quite a, 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 a data that, that he, he would put on there. Here happens to be a picture of my dad. And here's the back of the report. And up in the right hand corner, there's an LEM letters up there. What that is, is local experienced man. And, and what that would imply that this man was eligible to teach those mafia fellows from Chicago how to handle an ax and a saw and that kind of thing. The enrollees got uh, $30 a month, $25 of that was sent home to their parents, they got $5. And uh, if you were an LEM, you would get as much as $10 a month more. And it wouldn't go home to your parents. I mean, you'd, you'd, catch, you'd get the little bonus. Now, uh, it didn't take long for that camp shuction to, uh, to move. Uh, right away they decided that there was way, uh, it was too far up in the mountains and the heavy snows would make it impossible to function. That was one reason. Another reason was the mosquitoes was really bad. And the other problem was that the Italian boys thought it was great fun uh, terrorizing the black bears and teasing them and running with food and stuff. Well, all of a sudden the bears started to take it pretty serious. So they moved the camp. And they moved the camp down uh, between Maple Falls and Glacier. And it is located at a site where there's a church camp there. I think it's called Mount Baker Bible Camp, I think. And that's where this camp was. This is, this is the, the view of the camp. Uh, the camp was, by the time they got down there and they pitched the tents, then they decided, uh, Roosevelt's administration, that they decided to build wood buildings. So they, they right away started wood, making wood buildings. 
And when the program started, organized labor was really upset because they thought that it was taking away many jobs from them. So to make a compromise, uh, Roosevelt, when these camps were then made of wood, Roosevelt ha hired local men, not CCC boys. Camp had 23 buildings, and when a Glacier was originally built, they should have had four barracks buildings, but they only had uh, three, uh, 50 in each one. Within about a year or so, they, uh, they did build another one. Here's another view, looking right down the middle of it. Beyond the flagpole, out by those green trees, is the Mount Baker Highway, okay? Glacier's to your left, Maple Falls is to your right. Now, I was back last year in Minnesota, and I purposely went back there to go to this camp. This is Ratadu Camp and it's near a little town called Black Duck. I'm sure nobody's been to Black Duck. But it was a CCC camp back there. And, and by good fortune, it was never destroyed. And these are original buildings. And they have been dressed up, painted, and, and that wouldn't have been quite normal. But you can get the idea how big these buildings were. That would be like a barracks building right there. This is looking inside. And they were built, and, and the layout of the beds and stuff completely varied from location. The structural of these buildings was extremely light. These were two by six trusses, and they were about six foot on center. And they weren't, these buildings were not beefed up. In that spot in Minnesota, they got a lot of snow, and I don't know why they didn't collapse. Now this is a picture back up at, uh, at uh, Glacier, and it shows the Glacier building. And, and in a lot of the, I think all the buildings in Glacier had tar paper walls and then vertical uh, uh, back boards. And you can see uh, the, the boards have been painted. So they weren't really first class. This is another example. The guy on the right is that John Penn again really a, a true gentleman. Now if you can read this, this is the typical uh, this is a typical work day for at the CC camp and it, it ran very much like military. It didn't quite, it wasn't as stringent but it was stringent and, and you had to make your, your bed up, you had to every, just like in, a, in, a, in an army and you can see uh, the, the schedule that they worked to. Uh, and, and this was uh, the five days a week. And then if around camp they didn't get some of the work done uh, on Saturday or through the week, then on Saturdays they had to make it up on Saturday. So you can see very regimental. Here's a, a picture not at uh, Glacier, but it shows the the, the organized reveille of the raising and lowering of the flag. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot what that was. I had to go up and look at it. Uh, this is a menu, and uh, I'll show you pictures of the mess hall and the, and the dining and all that. But they ate very, very good. And, uh, and I, I have no knowledge of why they'd post that uh, menu. I don't know why they did it. Because you had no choice. That's what you were gonna eat. I should add right at this point that there was some cases in the CCCs where people in the kitchen were stealing the food, selling it on the black market, and then bring it in something of lesser value. And, and that became a big issue. Also, up at Glacier, one of the head men was building a motel in Blaine, and it seems like all of a sudden quite a few of the beds were disappearing. This is a menu, this is on Orcas Island, and this is a uh, Christmas dinner and it's uh, unbelievable, you probably can't read the menu down there, but it's, it was a, 
it was good. They made it a point that every enrollee would have at least one pound of turkey. This is a camp uh, kitchen or mess hall, and I just love to look at these guys. And, and what they have there is donuts. They've been making donuts, and, uh, and they're all eating the donuts. I, I don't think the, the uh, enrollees ever got any of the donuts. Look at the table that they're working on there to the right. Just look how thick that table is. Now this guy, he's putting uh, uh, lemon meringue pies, and he's putting the meringue in the pies. And just look at the look on him like, I'm, I'm saving some of it for myself. And look at the oven behind him. Here is a dining room setting. Uh, it was set just like the army. Everything was right in order. Uh, you came in, you, you had an assigned seat, and there was hardly any talking. And, uh, and it was uh, very serious. This is the barracks building. And this is probably exactly what Glacier looked like. And you can see the bed. I was told that under each one of those window sills, there was a shelf there that the enrollee could study stuff. But in the tail end of the bed, you could see that locker there. I'm going to show you more of that in a minute. But please, look at the way the, the blankets are all folded. It's very neat, very orderly. Just another point, there's no insulation in these buildings, so it got very cold in the winter. And down at the far end was one wooden stove. And uh, it was very common that uh, one guy's job was to go about twice a night through all the heated buildings and stoke, stoke up the fire. Uh, and it was a real game because he, he had a lot of fun coming in and waking everybody up. And so what was common in some of these barrack buildings, they would start bombing with shoes. And, and then they took the humor right out of it. But, and down at that end of the building was a room, and that's where all of their clothing was dried each night. And it was uh, near that heated area, so they, they dried fairly well. Now, I talked about the locker, the locker, the chest. This is one of the two men that I located. Uh, this one was about 98, and he was Lowell Henderson, Camp Glacier, and he was quite an artist. So what he did, he took, to, he took his locker and he decorated it with painting and, and printing and everything on it. He still got that locker. It's in the living room of his house. <laughs> Here is a picture. Now, I, I haven't got into the education yet, and I don't really know what's going on here, but if you look at the guy that's running the projector, he is, uh, He's pretty serious. Now, he could have been the medical doctor. Each camp had a, a medical doctor, and he could have been. But look at the, the people watching the movie. These aren't young guys. There's a couple, but they're, and they're pretty serious. I, I, could, I could assume what kind of a movie it is, but I'm not going to talk about that. Now, here's a little added thing. And uh, I don't know if anybody can recognize or not. This is the Nooksack River. And behind it up there is Mount Baker. And this is a raft floating down the river, and it has three movie stars on it. I think Wes got it. Uh, the name of the movie was Call of the Wild. Jack Oakey is on the left, uh, Clark Gable in the middle, and Loretta Young is on the right. And if you've seen the movie, they go floating down the river, and they uh, found gold and they found it on the on the bank and they built a cabin there. Well it's almost right across from where the CCC camp was. So the CCC boys right after dinner would hightail it down there to see what they could see that took place that day and maybe Loretta was still there. Uh, but I, I had no report that she was ever there. But uh, it was a big thing and, and that little cabin that they built for the movie was still there in the 60s, and then the river got it. And there's the cabin. 
Now, what this is, is a report on, with, with all the military support that they had there, they had a tremendous amount of paperwork to do. And so they have all kinds of reports. This report uh, is a report that, I think it's for a week, and it gives what they were performing, what they were doing. On the left, again, I'm sorry, I can't see it. Uh, I, I think on the left, it's the total number of enrollees. Uh, is it 199? 84. Pardon? 84. No. I think it's 199. No, go up above. 199. And then all the rest of those people that are there below that are the Army uh, workers, the Army support, okay? And then to the right is the report on all the projects they were working on. And um, I, I'm sorry, I can't see, but I, I know Twin Lakes Road is there. I think uh, Anderson Creek Road might be there, Canyon Creek Road. I think they were working up at Heather Meadows too. And so they, they were working in a variety of different places. And, and they'd have all these reports. Now, this is not a glacier, but it's an example. Everything was done in teaching the, the enrollees how to work and how to do it safely. And it was very, very common I've got numerous pictures. You see the guy at the right? He's the safety inspector. And in almost every one of these pictures, there's an inspector for the safety. So they're putting up a telephone pole, but he's right there, bird dog and all. And this one is a report on dynamite and the, and the use of dynamite. My father went into the camp. That was his one of his abilities. He was a dynamite man. So that's why they, they wanted him and got him in there, of course. Now this, I love this picture because if you look at it, here he is, not my dad, of course, but here he is, and look at all the sticks of dynamite he's got there right by his knee. And, and the bulk of their, their dynamite was used for blowing out stumps. It wasn't used so much for rock blasting and that. Uh, I'll get into that a little later, but uh, the, the, the CCCs, particularly up there, hardly had any equipment. Uh, here's a typical young man, and you can see that he's all set to be a mechanic for the rest of his life. And you can just see the pride he's got in that little, I think it's a Ford, I'm not sure. But uh, and here's another truck. Now, those trucks like that, they were e either used as a dump truck or they hauled the crew uh, to the work site. And the CCC boys worked every day. Uh, it didn't matter if it was raining, snowing, they would attempt to get to the job site. There was no such thing as not working. Now, this is an interesting thing and it was given to me by a, a fellow in Nooksack. And, and what it is, it's the company, uh, it's Glacier. Now, Glacier had two numbers. One was uh, F12 and then another one, 2915. And they had a different indication of what they were. It, it isn't worth the effort to try to figure it out. <laughs> I've done it and it's, I just go by F12. Anyway, this is the yearly uh, yearbook. And, and I'm sure most of all of us had these yearbooks when we went to high school. And so this is, I can't quite see, but this is the yearbook and this is Glacier. And inside the book, it talks about the management people and then it's got a bunch of pictures about uh, projects and things they're doing. A picture of uh, part of the uh, 200 men and there was three or four of these pictures, so you can get an idea how, how big it really was. There's a, just a bunch of activities. 
I'll get into the education in a little bit. Of course, we've got a guy working as a mechanic, and then we've got people uh, typing. Uh, we've got, they, they have all kinds of educational things. This, if you remember, it's just like in our yearbook, every, uh, you'd go around and get the autographs of people within the group, and this was what they were doing. You recognize any of them, Wes? <laughs> no. And then this was a real neat little deal. This was the bulldozer. And each one of these camps had a newspaper. And, and it was quite interesting in how they arrived at the... It, 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 it didn't start right away. It was probably a year and a half into the program, and then it started. They had a contest to see who could come up with the best name. And it was voted on by a group of them, Bulldozer. The guy that came up with Bulldozer, he got two cartons of cigarettes. Uh, and, and this is a strange uh, situation. I was home a few years ago, and a guy come up to my house, and he had a cardboard box, and he says, uh, I thought you might like these. And so he gave me the box, and I, and he says, well, okay, there, you got them, you take care of them. And I said, well, just a minute. And he says, I'm late, I gotta go. What he did, he brought me a box full of these old newspapers. And it started with the first one. And it went for about three years. And these are just great, fun reading because it's full of cartoons. And the big thing back in those days, they made fun of everybody. Everybody had a nickname. And, and this magazine, it was just full of little stories about different things. My father was an Italian, so they were always making fun of the Italians and how he should go, go to war with Mussolini. And, you know, of course, I didn't hear any rebuttal by him, but, uh, but it, it was really funny. And, and it went on to say that, uh, let's say, Joe, or Jimmy, you know, what kind of a name? Egghead, I'll call him Egghead came from Cedar Woolley, and now the, the, the guys are out of service. The guy goes to find his buddy, Egghead. He goes to Cedar Woolley, but nobody knows anybody by the name of Egghead. That was only in the CC. And here is uh, just, it, it was just full of little cartoons and making fun. Uh, it, it, it's really fun reading. This was the education building. And this is a different style of building. This is a vertical log. The logs were cut in half, and then the logs were stood up. And it's weird because it doesn't match any of the other architecture in the camp at all. But this was called the education building. And they had intensive education I'm going to show you right now uh, and and this is a, a first off when the CC's arrived all of the local people didn't like them they didn't want these these renegades coming into Maple Falls or Glacier and it's typical all over the country so they didn't like them and particularly the local 18 year old boys men they didn't want them there because they started looking at their girls. So it, it was very, it went on for quite a while. There would be fights and there would be all kinds of things. Pretty soon they became quite accepted. And they had many dances at the CCC camp. They put on uh, programs. This is a program here dedicating that, uh, that new building. And uh, down in the left corner they indicate uh, the band, and my father was playing the saxophone. Now this is a page that lists all, not all, but just lists so many different classes that you could take. Uh, and, and you'd be just amazed, I'm sorry, I can't see it. I can't remember. What, read, read them, uh, Wes, what, read some of the... Bookkeeping, chemistry, current events, first aid, journalism, 
uh, map writing, public speaking, radio and code practice, social uh, ethics, and typing. Yeah, so see, it wasn't just how to chop down a tree or nail a board together or something. It, they were really trying to educate these young men so they could fit into society. And uh, you, you can see by that. Now, one of the problems when the CCC boys first started, the program was only for six months. And at the end of six months, you moved on. Well, you can see that they would come into the camp They'd be interested in taking a class. The class might be half over when they can get into it. And then they're, they're move out of the camp. They wouldn't finish the classes. So they did some things to increase the length of time that they could stay in the camp. My dad stayed in there for three years and three months. And that's unbelievable why he was there. And uh, I'll just say that if anybody is interested and if you have a relative that was in a CCC camp and you want to find out about his, his uh, days there, you can, you can get that information. You can get it from the National Archives in St. Louis. And I have the, the names and the numbers and everything that you can get. You, you must have the uh, Social Security number. You must know the camp, the camp number, and you must know, uh, so, did I say Social Security? But anyway, uh, and, and in my dad's case, I got about 13 pages of information, so it was well worth it. And this is just another sheet. This is a different sheet with different, uh, with different uh, classes that were being held. Uh, they, they taught uh, swimming at Silver Lake. They, uh, they had a class for beekeeping, uh, all kinds of different classes, and, and, and a lot for first aid, that kind of a thing. Here is a diploma for an individual, and he was an auto mechanic. I do not know him. And now we're going to talk about the sports. And they were really into sports. And, and keep in mind, they worked hard for basically five days a week. And then they had the time to, to, to participate in sports. They called this, in the picture of this, uh, football. But I think this is rugby, don't you think? And, uh, but they did all kinds of, they had a baseball diamond, they had ping pong tables, pool tables, uh, all sorts of different sporting events. The, the, the uh, equipment for that did not come from the military, did not come. Uh, each one of these camps had a, a canteen where they sold uh, gloves and shaving stuff and that kind of thing. That money, was put in a pot, and that's what bought the baseball equipment and all that. I don't have very many pictures of the sports. Now what this is, when the CCCs first got to Glacier, the original Mount Baker Lodge had already burnt, but right after that, skiing became very popular, and now all of a sudden, they're skiing. And, and my dad uh, was ski jumping, and he crashed and broke two ribs. And that was the end of his skiing, actually. But, um, and, and they did it all, all the, the time. I mean, and all of a sudden, the CCC boys became very involved in the ski area and helping park cars, build ski jumps, build uh, uh, runs, uh, chair or rope toads. Uh, now, what this is, is a picture of a spike cam, or you could call it a side cam. And when, when we think about uh, the CCCs, the first thing you think about is trails up at Mount Baker and lookouts and all that. But they did many other things, and one of the things they did when I was a kid, they built a two-story fire station in, in uh, Deming. And this is up the Canyon Creek Road of the Middle Fork. And, uh, uh, and we were up there, and they had a, 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 a spike camp there, a side camp, and you could see the fireplace, and it was two stories high. Now, a, a side camp is, is just, a, it's not a permanent thing. It's meant to go in there and do some work, 
and and then move on or whatever. They had them. They had those camps up at uh, Heather Meadows. They had them at Baker Lake, uh, in quite a few locations. But this is quite something that this old fireplace is still standing, and they probably logged around it three times. They just logged, but they did everything in their power not to knock it down. They didn't. They didn't. Now I'm going to talk about the buildings at uh, some of the building projects. Now this is a glacier. This is a glacier ranger station. Those buildings that are there were all originals. They were built in about 1934, 35, 36 in that area. And, and they're really interesting to go inside them and look how well they're built. They are well built with lots of detail. Now down in Glacier, this was the ranger's house. And it was built in 1943. And it has sat there for years and years vacant, all moldy and everything else. And uh, the Forest Service put it up for bids and sold it just this last summer to an individual. And he's repairing it and really cleaning it up really good. So that, that was the ranger's house. This one is kind of tucked in behind, and they call this the bat house now because there's so many bats that live in it, and it's not used. Uh, and at Glacier, they actually had um, pack animals, and they belonged to the Forest Service. And so the Forest Service built a barn, and they actually cleared the land for a pasture, and this is the barn. And it was a beautiful old building, but it, it went down about four years ago. This is a typical building, but this is down at Woodby Island at, uh, at uh, Point Defiance. Point Defiance? What's that? Bridge, right at the bridge. <laughs> and it's an example. This is not built by the RCCCs, but you can see the beautiful woodwork. Now this is an example of looking and seeing some of the other types of work that the CCCs did. And here you can see the waist deep digging uh, drainage ditches. Now of course this isn't in our area, uh, but so you can see they did a lot of different things. And they had such a minimum amount of equipment. This is a picture going up Twin Lakes Road. and. Yes. And what is neat about this picture is if any of you go up to Twin Lakes Road very often, it, it, it's a terrible road. It, it, it needs so much repair work on it, it's terrible. But as you go up the road, and this is about halfway up, you will see they're starting to come up now to the surface. And what they are, are they're called punchings. And they're cedar rails split, old growth cedar, laid down on the ground and built the road over them. Well now when you're going up there, you can see them. Now they haven't rotted because they never had any oxygen to them. But now you can see them and you'll have to bump, bump, bump as you go up. Them. And, and it's, it's pretty unique. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, they, they built so many of these roads, but they did it. I think Glacier had two uh, bulldozers and one steam shovel for all of, all at work and they had a lot of hand shovels. Now this is interesting, uh, it never happened today. This is a gravel pit and it's right out in the river. It's right in the North Fork just below uh, uh, Silver, uh, well right there at Shuxon. And they're loading the trucks by hand and, and that's what they do. And uh, the comment on this picture was that 20 men could load 75 trucks a day. Now these are not Cowden trucks coming into town with 18 yards of gravel. These are about two and a half yards of gravel. But think about it, they could load up to uh, 75 of those trucks a day. Uh, of course, this is Nooksack Falls. And, and if you can see it, right up at the top there, right at the top of the fault, there's an old bridge going across, and that is the bridge that was uh, the Mazama hiking trail to climb Mount Baker. Uh, kind of interesting, 
the top of the falls where that strip of land is in the middle goes up to where the water flattens out. The guy that uh, is up there, he told me that he saw six college kids and what they were doing, they were hand in hand and they were starting on the left and they were wading through that water to the middle and then they waited some more. If the water is probably three feet deep, it's almost a hundred foot down. And this is an example of the bridges that the, forest, the CCC's built. This bridge was replaced the bridge I just showed you. And, and if you look at the quality of everything in that, it's, it's really un, unbelievable. Oh. I'm sorry, what happened there? Okay, uh, this is a bridge and, and they're building this bridge. They peeled the logs, they're rolling them into place. And uh, they, all that work is being done by hand and with like one bulldozer. Uh, this is Galena Campground, and when I was a kid, this was the most beautiful campground up in Mount Baker. Uh, and, and it was beautiful because you could drive this one lane bridge and you could camp there and water, and oh God, it was beautiful. There's three chairlifts towers in it now. <laughs> I guess everybody's got the right to do what they want to do, but it was sure a beautiful campground. Here's one of their uh, uh, items they built. They built quite a few of them up there, four or five of them. They built one right here I just mentioned, but it collapsed because of way too much snow. This is up at Darrington. There you go, with, And this is on the, the road going around to uh, Mountain Loop. And this is an original uh, shelter, uh, camping shelter. Uh, and it's really in good shape. Here is a picture of, uh, of uh, they're, they're cleaning up, they're, they're taking heather. And up at the heather meadows, it's been overused. And so now the CCCs is uh, uh, digging up heather, taking up their transplant. So they were concerned about the environment way back in the mid-30s. Now, there was never a shortage of men. And, and you can see here that uh, he, they were building a trail. And uh, they moved a lot of dirt. This is a picture of a, a group learning how to make a fire trail. And, and these guys, they each kind of had their own responsibility and they kept moving. If, if the guy had a job to, to chop roots out, that was his job. He didn't cut the brush down, he chopped roots out. Uh, a forest fire. This is a forest fire that was meant to burn some slash that got out of control. It happens all the time. This is a forest that's been burnt and, and so many times a forest fire goes through and it doesn't burn every tree or kill every tree. This is an example of every tree. Now what's happening here, they're building a fire lookout and the mules are carrying up the supplies. Now look at this picture really close. This is down in Oregon. And look at the height of that. It's, it's just unbelievable. And now look at it. See the, the canopy on top? I'd never go up there and think what it would do in the wind. Now the early lookouts were really very, very primitive, and here's an example of it. Many of them, they just ran a telephone wire across the country and, and nailed a phone to a tree. And uh, this is one of those very primitive situations. This, now you can see at this one, we're getting a little more modern, but this doesn't match the quality of a Forest Service one. And I don't know where this is. I hope that a lot of you can recognize that. That is Winchester Lookout. And that is when it was getting to be in very bad shape. And, and there was discussions about tearing it down. And thank God they did this to it. And uh, they saved it, and it was it was a joint venture between the Forest Service and 
uh, a private group here in Bellingham, or a club. This is a picture I really enjoy because everybody wants to go up in the mountains and man a lookout, okay? And, and what you think is it's going to be perfect weather, it's going to be nice and warm. I'll bet you that 60% of the time it's just like that. This isn't even at night, this is at about 5.30 in the afternoon. That's what you would see. This is, no, Wes. Do you recognize that? That is Three Fingers Lookout. Oh, okay. And uh, Three Fingers, if you're going through about uh, Arlington, yeah, Arlington, if you look toward the east, you'll see Three Fingers, mm -hmm. and it's got three prominent, you can see one there and another one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and th those are, that is the most difficult lookout to get to. You've got to climb ladders to get to it. Okay, so now we're back up at Mount Baker. This is uh, the Interpretive Center today. This is up at Terminal Lake. Uh, and, uh, and originally this was a ski hut, the original ski hut. Now it's an Interpretive Center. Now if you go upstairs in it, at one point they remodeled it. And this is what it looked like. Now, thank God, they went in and took it back to where it was originally. <laughs> Isn't that great? This is a ski escalator. And what this was, they, this was up in the ski area and it was pulled up and down with a, a, a logging yard. They'd pull it up, they'd pull it back down. And they would charge the people to ski or to ride up and ski down. There was a guy and he had two other workers with him and he owned it and everything was going good. The second year he was up there and he was uh, getting ready to start in the morning, an avalanche came down and killed him. It didn't kill the other two and that was the end of it. This was a uh, chair or rope toe uh, building that you can see up in that tree, you see those circles. That's what those were, were uh, rims off of what, Model A's probably? Think so? And, uh, but this, this, they had quite a few of these buildings up there. Notice the bracing on the side of the building. Uh, the, the tremendous weight of the snow and the, was very... This is a picture, I think it's about 1936, of the ski queen up there. And doggone it, I looked and looked, trying to find out who she was, but I never found out. Now, what do you think of these two? Isn't this a wonderful thing? Look at these two. Look at the equipment they've got. And, and the one, the one on the right, is that a sweater she took off or something? No, or is that a guy behind her? Is that a guy? It is, isn't it? Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about the Glacier Ranger Station. This is the first Glacier Ranger Station, and then to the far left, about the same point, you can see a building. That is the Glacier Hotel, and that was built by Jerry Bourne's dad, Charlie Bourne. This is the first. Uh, Ranger Station in the location where it is today. This is not the one, but this was the original. This is framing that. And I, I just love that building. I, I hope people appreciate it as much as I do. It's really well built. That building is 80 years old right now. And here's a picture of it. That's the interior, which is just great. This one, it has beautiful stonework on it, and it used to have an external restroom. It doesn't today. It, now it's got modern ones. But uh, you can see that curved wall there. And now see it in this picture to the left as the steps go around. It, uh, it's, it's good. And this was, they had a, a, a ranger that stayed there, kind of as a, a watchdog. 
and this was his house, and it sure doesn't seem to fit anything, but I like the picture of that woman sitting out there reading the newspaper. Now, the, the, uh, the CCCs were really into uh, public work, or doing things for the public. And at the camp, this was the infirmary right here. And it became also a first aid station. And what that meant was, if anybody in, in uh, Glacier got cut or anything, they could bring them here. If there was a car wreck, they could bring them here. And that was all part of what this, this uh, medical situation was. They also participated in the, uh, it was, I think it was called the Tulip Parade. It wasn't a blossom time, in Bellingham. They also had about eight members that were part of a mountain rescue a search group. And in 1939, a big avalanche came down and, and buried uh, six Western Washington students. And, and they were all killed. And it came way down from way up to the left all the way down into the big crevasse field there. The uh, CCC boys were part of that search. They were actually the second party up there. And here they're skirting around some carafes. And if you climb Mount Baker, you'll appreciate this picture. And here, I hate to tell it, but they're taking the, one of the bodies down. Uh, six, I think it was six. Six died, didn't it? Yeah. Okay, and this fellow here is uh, a Lowell Henderson, and he's the guy that painted up his locker box, okay? And he was in uh, Aberdeen, you know, uh, yeah, Aberdeen. And I, I found him, went down and spent the afternoon with him. Really a nice gentleman. And this is John Penn, and John Penn was the guy that was waiting to read the book before he died. And uh, he was a great, he was a neat guy, he was real tall, about six, seven or so. He lived in uh, Everson. And when he got out of the CCC camp, he started a Western band, or he was part of a Western band. And I think the name of it was the Westerners, I think. There was about four or five guys, and they had a young lady singing in their group. And he taught that young lady how to play the guitar. Loretta Lynn. This is probably, this is the last structure that is standing uh, in, in any uh, uh, it, the period, it's the last one. This was up at Shutson, this was the toilet. And if you go look at it, and I have another picture, it's leaning against a tree now, it's probably totally fell down. But, uh, but the detail in it was really good. You could tell that it wasn't just thrown together. There it is now. And it's, now, I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures of where the CCC camp is today. And this is probably where home base would have been in the baseball diamond, okay? And there's uh, the Bible camp sign that I spoke of. Now, I'm going to just give you a little history on this statue, but I forgot to tell you a couple of things here. Uh, the, the glacier camp started in June the 12th, 1933. Uh, the maximum numbers of Arolis in 1935 was 500,000, almost 500,600, and 2,600 camps throughout the, throughout the uh, country. Glacier Camp closed on July the 2nd, 1941. There had been about four attempts to close it but it had been, the local people didn't want it closed. And so they fought it off and then they lost. The CCC program was completely shut down in June of uh, 1943. Now, another thing about the CCC is now why it was shutting down is the war had started and the employment had come back and there just wasn't a demand for these kids to make $5 a month. But uh, they, uh, 
And, and when these kids, a lot of them went right in the Army, and they won and were honored with many, many uh, uh, rewards for the bravery and stuff. They had been through a basic camp already. They knew how to live like in, in the Army, and so they were really rewarded. They were very good. Okay, this is a statue of, uh, and this is at the Glacier Ranger Station. He is standing on uh, Olivine Rock. If you, if you go up there, go look. It's a beautiful green rock, and uh, and he's there, and uh, he he is a bronze casting. He's made in six, eight pieces. He's in eight pieces, and they they them bronze or brazing together. Here's a sign that recognizes it. It was uh, done by uh, the CC Leg Legacy Group. And, uh, and some local people. And, uh, and the Forest Service was very involved, but there was no government money in it at all. And this is the group that was involved. Uh, the woman on the left is Deb Paul. She's with the Forest Service. She was very good. The squinting guy is me. The next one is John. And, uh, and the next one is the statue. Uh, everybody calls the statue George because nobody else knows anybody that was in the camp. So it was my dad. <laughs> and Janet Oakley there. And then this next guy was Tim Montgomery. He was from San Francisco. And he was the area guy of doing these statues. This is just a map. We were number 73 in the country, and I think it's up to about 76 now. Uh, there's two of them in Washington State. Now this is a kind of an interesting little story. This is in Nine Mile in Missoula, Montana camp. Now Nine Mile was a camp that had 600 people in it, not 200. And I've, I don't know the reason. Now this little building was built by the CCC boys and it was built as a playhouse for the ranger's little daughter. Okay, And it's still there. And uh, it talks about it here. And this lady, I don't know if she's still doing it, but she was doing it a few years ago. She would come there every summer with grandchildren <laughs> and sweep out the playhouse. <laughs> okay, that's the program for me tonight. Is there any questions? Oh, you guys are good. You're not even gonna ask me any questions. <laughs> you can ask, we're, on, we're live. You know, there were five billion trees planted by the CCC. Is that right? Yeah. God. And, and I forgot to say that uh, the, 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 the enrollees came from all over. And at one point, there was a bunch of prisoners at Glacier from um, Brooklyn. And they were dispatched out on the guide to the tree nursery. And every morning, they were hauled out there, brought back, just them and they stayed in a special space in the barracks, but they did that. So, anything else, Wes? Yeah. Okay. Good night. <laughs>